Yes. For the panel discussion, we would now like to invite the panelists up on stage. Dr. Yasu Yuki Sawada, Chief Economist and Director General ADB. <coughs> Dr. Ho Iko, Chief Economist, Asian Plus 3 Macroeconomic Research Office. Dr. Hamza Ali Malik, Director, United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Dr. Si Yan Park, Director, ADB. And lastly, Professor Ramkishan Rajan from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, okay, uh, let's uh, move on to the uh, second uh, uh, activities of today's uh, uh, event, uh, panel discussion uh, based on uh, AEIR reports. So uh, it, I'm glad to have uh, uh, regions uh, top experts uh, today as a panelist. Uh, from uh, your left, uh, uh, Dr. Ho E Ko. Um, uh, Dr. Ho E Ko is a uh, uh, chief economist of AMRO, uh, responsible for overseeing and developing the work on macroeconomic and financial market surveillance on East Asia, on the member economies uh, 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 in the region. He's also a member of the senior management team responsible for setting strategic directions and management of AMRO. Prior uh, to joining AMRO, Mr. Ko has a, 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 long, a long career at uh, IMF, at International Monetary Fund. He was a deputy director of Asian Pacific Department, uh, uh, responsible for overseeing surveillance work in six ASEAN and 12 Pacific Island countries. And also Dr. Ko was uh, IMF deputy res resident resident representative uh, in the People's Republic of China from 1991 to 1993. And um, uh, from 2009 to 2010, Mr. Ko was head of economic development and chief economist at the Abu Dhabi Council for Economic Development, ABCD. Uh, uh, next to, uh, from the left uh, is uh, Dr. Sinyong uh, Park. Uh, uh, Sion Park is the Director of Regional Cooperation and Integration Division in uh, Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department, ADB. Uh, she manages a team of economists to examine policy issues and develop a strategy to regional cooperation and integration. During her career with ADB, she has been main author and contributor to ADB flagship publication, including Asia uh, Development Outlook, as well as Asia uh, Capital Market Monitor, Asia Economic Monitor, Asia Bond Monitor, and ADB Country Diagnosis Study uh, Series. And uh, actually, uh, today's AEIR 2017 was uh, 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 led by uh, Dr. Park. Uh, and then uh, uh, Dr. Malik, uh, 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 Hausa uh, Ali Malik, uh, joined the Union ESCAP in uh, November 2014, and he is currently working as the Director of Macro Economic Policy and Financing for Development Division. Before joining Union ESCAP, uh, uh, Dr. Malik uh, worked as a Director of Monetary Policy Department of Central uh, State Bank of Pakistan, SBP, which is the country's central bank, from June 2007 to November 2014. He was a member of the Bank's International Monetary Policy Committee and a member of the Government of Pakistan uh, teams that regularly participated in discussion with International Monetary Fund. Uh, he also serves as an editor of SVP's working paper series uh, and uh, appeared uh, uh, regularly on electronic media to communicate SVP's uh, monetary policy stance. Uh, uh, Finally, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Ramesh Rajan uh, from Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, professor Rajan is a professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School. Uh, 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 prior to this, uh, he was a professor of economics at ESSEC Business School, uh, Asia Pacific, uh, uh, and before uh, uh, that he was a professor of international Good policy at George Mason University in Virginia, USA. He has also taught at the University of uh, uh, Adelaide in Australia, uh, Singapore Management University, and Claremont McKenna College in California, among other places. 
Okay, so let's uh, start the panel discussion. Uh, uh, so, uh, 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 Dr. John Park uh, uh, already John Kang already um, uh, shared with us the main uh, key messages of uh, uh, this year's AEIR report. And uh, uh, actually, uh, AEIR, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Kang's uh, uh, presentation shows, uh, three parts. First one is overall kind of a trade and investment outlook, and then medium term. Uh, this time we share a new uh, uh, regional cooperation integration index. And final part is about uh, a special report on 20 years after Asian financial crisis. So let me start from the uh, last part. Uh, the last part uh, report's main message was uh, after 20 years of Asian financial crisis. Asia seems to be standing strong, uh, going well. However, uh, that special chapter also identified uh, uh, several challenges, uh, uh, heavy bank dominance in corporate investment financing, also uh, 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 indebtedness in uh, foreign currency denominated manner, especially US denominated uh, 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 debt financing. Uh, also increasing uh, indebtedness of household or uh, corporations in some countries. So uh, seeing these uh, reports uh, highlights, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, postulate this question. Uh, basically, do you agree or disagree with the analysis of this uh, report? Uh, uh, and uh, especially how do you assess resilience of Asian economies and financial markets 20 years after the crisis? And uh, if you agree with this view of report stating that double mismatch problem is still a potential threat of Asia economy's uh, financial resilience, then what's the right way? Uh, what what's the uh, you know strategy to tackle these potential uh, uh, risks of the financial sector? So uh, let's uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Ko to uh, for the first part of your uh, response. Uh, thank you, uh, Sawada san. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, launch of the report. I think it's an excellent report. <laughs> I must congratulate the authors for this. Uh, and it allows us to track you know, the integration in the region. Uh, so, and um, on, on, on the question that you raised about the... I, that generally agree with the view in the in the in the report. Uh, it's an excellent report, as I said. Uh, we actually did a study uh, ourselves about you know the twenty years after the Asian financial crisis, uh, just and we launched it in May of this year. And our findings are fairly similar. Uh, I would say uh, in general, we see that the the region has become a lot more resilient uh, than before the Asian financial crisis. Uh, what you know. What I like to uh, maybe uh, point out is that the resilience of the region, uh, you know, arose in part from the crisis. <laughs> so in a way, you know, we have uh, not wasted the crisis. Uh, crisis is an opportunity to strengthen yourself. And after the Asian financial crisis, many of the countries took the lessons of the crisis to heart and re and worked really hard to strengthen their financial system, the corporate governance system, the macroeconomic fundamentals. And you know, we, we, we look at the, the 20 years in two periods, one of the first 10 years and then the second 10 years. And in the first 10 years, uh, you know, they, they took all the measures to rebuild themselves. But while they are doing this, they were actually helped by the fact that the US and Europe were doing very well at that time. So export, you know, uh, rebounded very strongly, growth uh, managed to recover, and that gives them time to rebuild, repair the system, and strengthen themselves. And then came the global financial crisis, and they got clobbered. Uh, and when they got hit by the crisis, and because they, of all the reforms that they have done, they were a lot more resilient than before, right? So in a, in a sense, uh, you know, uh, the, the all the reform was in some sense, test, the resilience system was tested by the global financial crisis and then the sovereign, European sovereign wealth uh, debt crisis. Uh, there was a real uh, life stress test on the system. And I think the 
emerge out of that very well. Uh, so I would say the, 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 the region has definitely become a lot more resilient and subsequent to that, they were again tested by you know, the taper tantrum, the huge volatility in capital flows during the last 10 years, and they had to adapt to that by taking on macro prudential measures. You know. So there was a constant learning and adapting to, to, to shocks uh, uh, during the last uh, 20 years. You know. And because of that, uh, you know, I, I'm, when you look at the, the countries in the region now, uh, I think they are much more resilient now. That's not to say there's no vulnerabilities, and they, those have been identified, I think, in the report. Uh, certainly, debt has gone up. Uh, Significantly, and that was a, that's a source of concern to you know to us when we do our surveillance of the countries. And, and but still, uh, despite the increase in in the, in, in the debt, uh, I think the uh, the regulators and the policy makers have been very mindful of the lessons from the Asian financial crisis, and they took measures to make sure that the crisis doesn't become excessive. Uh, Nevertheless, the debt level is much higher than before, and, and you know, which has been uh, documented. Uh, and we were very concerned that if, if, the, if the interest rate were to spike up because of you know, uh, uh, some shocks, in, in, you know, for instance, uh, a, a very rapid increase in interest in the U.S. because of normalization interest rate, that it would hit uh, the, the, the private sector quite badly. That has not happened, as it turns out. Uh, and and now looking forward, we I think that the risk of that happening is not high, it's not negligible. But at the same time, I, I think it's quite small, uh, partly because you know Trump has not been able to deliver on, on, on all the, the 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 measures that he that he, that he promised. Uh, and as a result, long-term interest rate has been relatively stable, you know, and protectionism has not come about. So actually, my view is that you know. Uh, the risk to the system now uh, of, of, of a major shock is, 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 is diminished and that the system is quite robust and uh, to those kind of shocks. Then there's a very specific question about uh, whether the double mismatch is still an issue and I, and I don't really think it's, it's an issue anymore because uh, most, most of the regulators really took this uh, problem to heart. And after the global financial crisis, they really uh, clamped down on uh, corporate borrowing in foreign currency if they don't have a natural hedge. Or if they do borrow, they require them to hedge. Uh, and that's the case, for instance, in Indonesia recently. After they got hit by the paper tantrum and the downturn in commodity prices, they require corporates uh, who don't have a natural hedge to hedge. Uh, and so, actually, when you look at the shocks in the last few years, that is not it's been an issue at all, the double mismatch is, uh, that's mentioned here. Uh, maybe I'll stop here. Thank you, thank you. One very interesting message I got from your uh, intervention was uh, crisis may be a mother of uh, financial resilience. That's a very important key message from uh, Asian crisis lesson. So now let's uh, uh, ask uh, Sino for her uh, response. Um, thank you, Sarada-san. Um, well, I think um, uh, we uh, also, uh, you know, pointed out that uh, the region's uh, uh, general like, financial system health have improved uh, since the uh, crisis, and that uh, we've also you know, gone through the uh, global financial crisis about ten years ago, and uh, it, in a way, proved that uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, the banking sector uh, itself uh, within uh, its own uh, balance sheet management and uh, through much greater uh, and then a stronger you know the micro prudential uh, supervision regulation uh, that uh, we are seeing better um, coping mechanism and the risk management mechanism within the uh, region's banking system and then uh, given that actually the banks are uh, the major, uh, the uh, major uh, pillar of the region's financial systems, and the overall uh, financial resilience for the region is uh, definitely uh, in a good shape. Uh, but 
uh, as uh, already pointed out several times, that uh, you know, we, what, we are, what we are seeing is um, pockets of uh, vulnerability and then fragility. Uh, some countries do experience a rapid rise in the corporate and then uh, household debts. And uh, some countries also experience uh, deterioration in the uh, uh, bank balance sheets through uh, the increases in the NPL. Um, so though those are, uh, you know, the uh, I think uh, weakness and uh, some weak spots that we try to identify and also uh, remind the policymakers to remain uh, much more resilient, given that the uh, U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve is now taking uh, steps toward the uh, uh, policy normalization. Uh, with the high indebtedness, so we will likely to experience. Uh, more strains on the uh, funding uh, side of uh, our uh, system. Um, that's where we also like to highlight that uh, you know the, the, the structural uh, weaknesses that has been fairly long term in the region. Um, uh, it's not necessarily the bank dominance. In fact, the bank is actually quite dominant uh, in Europe as well. But um, what we also note is that uh, uh, the in increasing the debts issued in foreign currency. And when I say foreign currency, we're just being moderate, actually. It's actually US dollar. <laughs> About 80% uh, of, uh, you know, 70-80% of uh, the Asian uh, debts issued in the foreign currency are in US dollars. That make the region uh, unnecessarily, maybe necessarily, given that the dollar is actually still the uh, main sort of medium of financial transactions and also trade. Um, but it ex uh, exposed the region a little uh, more than, than, than it should be to the dollar funding risks. And uh, I think uh, each time when there is uh, turbulence in the global financial markets, uh, that Funding risk channel, especially the dollar funding risk channel, actually adds stress on the uh, region's financial markets. So what we like to actually focus is, uh, you know, in terms of uh, that sort of uh, rel heavy reliance and maybe over reliance of one single currency in the uh, foreign debt uh, could be an added sort of burden to the uh, financial uh, system. That's why we like to uh, highlight that, uh, you know, uh, that exposure makes the uh, region's financial market especially vulnerable to changes in the U.S. monetary policy because that also relates to global liquidity conditions and that again affects the conditions on our bilateral exchange rates against the U.S. that associates again with the uh, capital outflows. So these, uh, you know, some may even remind of, um, be reminded of the original sin. Somehow that we do have this sort of original sin still in our system. That uh, uh, as the region does not have uh, 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 fully internationally convertible the reserve currency within the region, and that uh, we do not somehow have more diversified um, funding mechanisms in different currencies. Uh, there are various uh, ways of trying to address these issues. Of course, you know, we can uh, uh, increase the reliance of uh, funding in our local currencies or regional currencies. And even in the international, we can go broader than the, just the dollar. Uh, uh, given the difficulties the Eurozone is experiencing now, the Eurozone is, the Euro is uh, losing a bit of a uh, attractiveness, but still it is uh, uh, one of the major currencies that we can consider diversifying our funding sources into. So uh, the balance in our funding sources and then funding currencies are going to be a quite an important uh, challenge for us uh, to uh, go forward. Um, and then uh, again, it's um, not necessarily just a double mismatch, but uh, what we see that the banking sector, of course, uh, uh, through a very strong microprudential regulation, have increased in its uh, health and resilience. But what we see is that the region does not have a very comprehensive macroprudential. So, in a way, the like a mac, mic, some of the microprudential uh, you know, supervision regulation does not necessarily 
uh, come to the level of uh, macro prudential uh, regulation and supervision. We need to be much more mindful of the changes in the global financial cycle. We need to be much more mindful of the capital flows, the directions and the, the magnitude uh, in response to the regions, uh, you know, the economic conditions. So these type of uh, macro prudential that considers the, the speed and then the magnitude of uh, the credit itself and then the liquidity condition, especially when we are relying too much on the single, single uh, foreign currency, especially dollar, we have to be very much mindful to uh, think in advance and have much more buffers in our system to respond to these changes in the global, uh, you know, the financial and then the dollar liquidity conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Park. Uh, so heavy reliance on uh, dollar denominated uh, uh, borrowing, and also uh, there is a room for a further, you know, uh, elaborating on macro prudential uh, policies. I think that these are very uh, important, and uh, peculiar characteristics of Asia and uh, ch important challenge of Asia. So now, uh, Dr. Malik, uh, you have a long uh, experience at Central Bank uh, in uh, Pakistan. So what do you think about this uh, risk, potential risk assessment uh, uh, having 20 years after uh, Asia financial crisis, uh, cumulative uh, lessons and experiences? So what, how, how do you uh, assess the current situation in the Asian Pacific region? Um, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Olasen and Sinjin Park from ADP for inviting me and sharing my views here. Um, as I was going through the report last night, um, trying to see where we can add value or more comments to that discussion, um, largely the points are taken. I think Asian financial resilience has increased for sure. It has already been highlighted a couple of times. I won't repeat that. There is a certain need, given the especially the kind of dominance, um, to go into capital market development, global currency uh, uh, bond market development in particular. But let me highlight some broader issues. Um, as food for thought, coming in the central banking background, um, are these measures that we are taking or we are highlighting, are these sufficient to prevent a future crisis from taking place? They may be necessary now to deal with it, but do we, can, we, can we say something on how do we go about making sure these kind of episodes, Asian financial crisis for instance, and more importantly the global financial crisis does not take place again? Have we really evaluated as policymakers globally why these crises keep happening at an increased increase frequency. So let me share a few broader points. Um, first basic observation is finance basically is part of the monetary system. Same goes for global finance. Global finance essentially is a part of international monetary system. In my opinion, I think many of the world, uh, observers also say, um, currently the global economy does not have a coherent international monetary system. In the sense there are no rules um, agreed or automatic uh, mechanisms that can influence the behavior of countries' policies in a manner that benefits the entire global economy. This is probably the fundamental issue. Uh, the absence actually of a reliable mechanism how to correct imbalances. Let me give you a very specific example. The very debate on current account or persistence of current account imbalances between the US, for instance, running deficits for long periods, and China and many other countries running surpluses for many years. Why it keeps happening? Why is there is no mechanism that can correct the behavior? We assume that potentially exchange rate adjustment will lead to adjustment automatically. Deficits countries experiencing um, depreciation and other way around for the surface countries and automatically system will correct. But we know also from practice it does not happen. Countries do intervene in the policy market for many practical reasons. Uh, to build policy reserves for instance as is the case in many Asian economies. Um, to prevent potential implications uh, on the foreign denominated debt of firms. Uh, they don't want rapid depreciations. Uh, to control inflation in many developing countries, they don't want depreciations. Uh, on day-to-day -day trading actually takes place in financial markets. Don't think that, uh, don't look at the data on current economic imbalances. So there are many reasons why the assumed adjustment mechanism of exchange adjustment does not really work. And we know that imbalances continue to persist because there is no mechanism globally that can address those concerns. 
More recently, actually, taking this debate further, Bank of Interest Settlements has highlighted the financial imbalances issues as well, which is also growing very tremendously and very rapidly, shedding light on these kind of trends. Um, the second major concern we need to think about in, if you want to have resilience over long periods of time, the global system does not have what we call a nominal anchor for money or credit creation in the system. Um, it used to be gold standard, it used to be Bretton Woods based arrangement, but since then there is no global anchor which can pin down the long-term growth of money or credit in the system. It keeps growing pretty much without control. Who is creating that money? Essentially financial markets. The same implications we have for domestic systems. Are central banks really in control of creating money? Or is it the private banks actually that create money? We saw that as a reaction uh, to the global financial crisis when many mass economies tried to jumpstart the economy by extending credit, uh, by lowering interest rates to historically low levels, by coming up with all sorts of measures to give liquidity in the system. Still, the economy did not take off. Most economies, banks were reluctant to go out and give credit. So there's a disconnect between how money is created in the system as well. The same principle applies uh, globally as well. There's no normal anchor, so there's always going to be an element of excess creation of, of credit, which I think Bank of, Bank of International Settlements call it excess financial elasticity of the system uh, that needs to be addressed. One more issue actually I'll just sort of put for soil throughout is, uh, which has uh, relevance in our region more, is the supply of adequate liquidity in a systemic manner for the lender of last resort. Things go wrong, who do you go to, uh, uh, go to get redressed? Well, in the global system, it's supposed to be international monetary fund. But we know, especially in Asia, from experience 20 years ago, countries are extremely reluctant to go to them unless they are really desperate. There is a stigma attached to going to IMF for many reasons, which is beyond the scope of current discussion, um, but we are aware of those concerns. Do we have a similar credible mechanism in the region? Should there be a similar mechanism in the region? I think AMRO is probably, probably the best example that is working on those lines. How far they can go or should be going um, remains to be seen, right? But that essentially is an issue um, to create these institutions where you discourage countries, for instance, from accumulating unnecessary foreign exchange reserves. Because if things go wrong, they can always have recourse to some, some short-term liquidity facility, which currently does not exist. There is no influence on countries' uh, specific exchange rates as well. Um, how do you adjust the system? So these are some of the broader concerns I think um, we should think about um, building upon the progress we have made in the region so far uh, in the last 20 years. A lot of resilience is there. It's basically like a patient keeps coming back to the doctor with flu symptoms all the time. We have come up with better medicines now. We can cure him or her very quickly. But we're not really investigating why he keeps coming back to us all the time. Um, we need to go back to some deeper question and say, how can we address those concerns that we really, really avoid uh, having the same situation every few years now and then? It's very devastating implication. I think the report covers this link between financial cycles, boom and bust, and real economy very comprehensively and very adequately, and rightly so. So those things need to be <coughs> borne in mind when we like to talk about how to take forward uh, the resilience uh, that we have earned in a very hard manner. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Malik, for pointing uh, quite uh, fundamental, uh, broader, uh, you know, uh, market uh, uh, issues of uh, global uh, level as well as regional level. I, I, I hope we can come back later to discuss uh, deeper. And uh, uh, I'd like to now uh, uh, invite uh, Professor Rajan for your response to the uh, reports and uh, views on lessons after 20 years of Asian financial crisis. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, first, let me again congratulate the authors. The report actually read it very high quality overall. Uh, I especially like the chapters, apart from the team chapter, the chapters on FDI financial integration and the regional uh, integration index. Uh, well done. Uh, let me be, since a lot of discussion has already been had, let me be sort of answer the question in rather pointed form. So if you look at the so Asia resiliency, absolutely. In some senses, we saw the uh, the sharp, quick and sharp rebound after the global financial crisis really attests to the uh, increased resiliency of, of Asia. The report I've written it down here has highlighted three concerns: bank-based financial system. Now, bank-based financial system on its own may 
from a structural perspective, there may be issues relating to financial inclusion as well as growth, but from a financial stability perspective, in, if, there, if there are problems and most of the finance is concentrated in the, in, in the banks, that could also have macroeconomic implications. That's, that's, where, that's why the focus on NPLs, that empirical exercise is so important. A quick point about that particular exercise, I think as in the case of debt, the issue of NPLs is not so much a shock to NPLs, it's really about thresholds. Right? And so it would be more interesting to see because within, within a certain threshold, you may be able to grow out of the NPL problem. So really beyond the threshold, then NPLs become a real problem, as we've seen to some extent in the case of India. China is an interesting case. There's much greater opacity, so we can't really tell the extent of NPLs. But, uh, so I'd, I'd focus more on threshold, but I accept the uh, importance of this issue. Uh, the second issue that was pointed out is rising household and corporate uh, debt. I'll come back to that. And the third aspect, which is the focus uh, here uh, has been on external uh, uh, liabilities in foreign currency terms. When you think about NPLs, and uh, Sinyang has sort of talked about this, when you think about the, the banks and resiliency of the banks, you think about microprudential regulations. When you think about rising household and corporate leverage, what Singapore, Hong Kong, and a number of Asian countries have done is impose macroprudential regulations. But what about the last dimension, which is about foreign mm -hmm. currency liabilities? In some sense, it's not very surprising. You'd say, well, Currencies have become more flexible. There's been much greater focus on bond market, local currency bond market development. Despite that, there's been massive increase in foreign currency liabilities. But to some extent, that's not entirely surprising. The latest IMF report, on the finance, uh, what they call it, the financial stability report, something talks about how since QE, uh, 260 billion uh, of liquidity has poured into emerging economies. A large part of that is Asia. And US dollar being a funding currency, in some, to some extent, given this massive influx of Liquidity, all the other attempts that were done in terms of exchange rate flexibility, building up bond markets, etc., that probably would have shown up in terms of reduction in foreign currency liability absent this huge infusion of uh, liquidity post QE. So now the question is, what do you do about this? Right? There are three three things you could do. One is benign neglect, which a lot of countries have have done. Benign neglect of this, this problem exists. We just leave it. Hope uh, uh, it goes away or doesn't really have impact on the economy. The second would be management. Management in terms of building up liquidity buffers in the event there's a crisis, that's where own reserves, as well as the CMIM, AMRO, et cetera, become so relevant, regional reserves, given that we don't have international uh, lender of last resort. And the third dimension would be actual prevention. Now, prevention, with the possible exception of Korea, which has, in 2010, 2011, dealt with sort of open foreign currency positions in, in terms of derivatives, non-core foreign currency liabilities beyond Korea, most other countries in the region have undertaken macroprudential uh, policies that's focused more on the banking sector in terms of capital-based policies or in terms of liquidity-based policies, loan-to-value ratios, etc. So the question is, should we take this into, should we undertake certain policies, preventive policies to deal with this? I actually think yes, for two reasons. One, one there could be a systemic risk involved. Two, and some of this has already been discussed. Two, Sunil uh, alluded to this point. It also is a negative externality when you have too much foreign currency borrowing in the sense that the monetary policy tends to become less effective, which then has implications for the overall economy. And so then the question then is how do you deal with it? I think again, we expand macroprudential policies to also look at foreign currency liabilities. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, actually, we have uh, 15 minutes or so remaining, so probably <laughs> Uh, let's open uh, the floor uh, for questions. Uh, and in uh, the meantime, I'd like to add one question. So together, all together, uh, each panelist can respond. Yeah. Any questions uh, from the floor? Good afternoon. Thank you for the very interesting analysis. I hear the concern about NPLs and uh, loans in US dollars. Um, would there be any political, uh, social, economic, or political scenarios that would trigger greater risk? For example, if there was a crisis, I hope not, but for example, if there's a crisis in Korea and America is involved, how would that have um, economic implications? And how would it impact the financial resilience of Asia? That's my first question. The second question would be, um, how will um, fintech and cryptocurrency impact financial resilience in Asia? Thank you. 
other question? Yeah. Probably we can take three or so questions and then we can come back to each panelist. Dr. Park, your, your concern was very reliant on the US dollar. Isn't it ironic that a country which is heavily in debt has this currency as a reserve currency? So my question is that a day of reckoning has to come from this. So how do you see the future? Because at the moment, the China and Japan and some of the other countries are funding the United States basically, which is in huge debt. So what happens someday when they stop funding? I'd like to add it up. Okay, one more question. Hi, uh, my name is Asif. I'm from Cardiff University Sustainability Policy Institute. My question is more about we have heard about what Isha has learned from his experience in 1997. So that's learning from experience. Um, my question is a bit more futuristic. What we are actually learning from observation, but at the same time we have seen the global financial crisis unfolding in Western countries and the risk in. Uh, Western economies were closely connected to. And one risk factor in the financial sector has uh, growing importance right now in the West is exposure to ESG risk. So I don't actually have anything about what Asian financial institutions or financial system, financial governance mechanism is doing in terms of preparedness for ESG risk which might be coming in future. So we, we had a four uh, 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 four uh, uh, questions, and uh, uh, I'd like to ask about one question, uh, which is quite different. Uh, we have been focusing on the financial dimensions of, uh, you know, uh, regional integration, but now um, uh, we see uh, expansion of global trade, especially Asia, uh, seems to be quite strong, uh, expanding both export and import, and also interregional uh, trade and. Uh, investment, foreign direct investment uh, expanding, and uh, it seems to be the uh, foundation for updated uh, you know, growth. Now, uh, Asia, according to our uh, forecast, uh, Asia's growth will be 5.9%, which is better than last year and uh, better than our April forecast, uh, mainly due to uh, you know, new sort of uh, uh, augmented gain arising from uh, trade relationships. So, uh, my question I'd like to ask, if uh, some of you can respond, is uh, whether, whether do you see this uh, uh, benefit, uh, temporal uh, phenomena, or do you see any mid-term kind of structural change, uh, uh, benefit arising from uh, some, you know, uh, fundamental change in Asia's trade? So that's the one question I'd like to ask, because we much so concentrate in the financial aspect. Now uh, I'd like to ask uh, each panelist in uh, reverse order uh, to respond. Uh, and uh, if you can kindly give, give us a uh, response in two minutes or three minutes, that will be great. Um, some interesting questions, but from the flow, but let me uh, talk about the trade dimension. So if you go back to 
a couple of years ago, we talked about slowdown in international trade, and some of the arguments that were made was, well, part of this is cyclical because slowdown in uh, overall uh, uh, economic growth, especially in advanced economies, uh, rebalancing in China and uh, income elasticity or import elasticity of consumption is lower than in the case of investment and exports in the case of China. Uh, uh, limits of supply chain fragmentation, it's sort of reached up the upper limits there, and generally greater uncertainty and protectionism at the micro level. So now that we see a rebound, what's going on here? A well, part of it is clearly cyclical. Advanced economies have rebounded. We know the import income elasticity of uh, imports in the advanced economies uh, is, exceeds that of emerging economies, so that's a big dimension. The sharp slowdown in imports in China has reversed. Uh, uh, we'll have to see structurally what rebalancing implies. Uh, so these are sort of, I think, from a cyclical perspective, these are uh, uh, two main reasons. From a structural perspective, though, there are some interesting things going on. One is clearly, with, on the one hand, we had a combination of uh, declining co shipping costs as well as technology which allowed for production fragmentation and a lot of countries uh, 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 became part of the regional and global value chain which, uh, which allowed for significant international trade. But now we still have shipping costs low but the technology is reversing direction in the sense now it's actually leading to a, if you will, concentration of production in certain uh, places with automation, 3D, uh, 3D printing, etc. You don't necessarily need to fragment your production to the lowest cost destinations. So how do you, so from structural per, uh, perspective, there are reasons to expect trade to continue to slow down, not go nearly as fast uh, as, uh, as it uh, was historically. How do you deal with this? Well. Obviously, from a technological perspective, you don't want to say uh, reverse uh, the technological uh, advancements. But I think from a policy making pers uh, from a policymaker's perspective, there are a few things that can be done. Continue working towards reducing cross-border transactions. That involves increased connectivity, whether it's the China-led OPOR, whether it's improving trade facilitation, free trade agreements, all, of, all with the aim of trying to reduce cross-border costs and improve connectivity. Also, so that's from a policy perspective. There are other things that could be done, but also interestingly from a private sector perspective, private sector is now sitting there quietly. If you think about the shipping industry, one of the big things that are going, that's going on in the shipping industry, sort of uh, development of light composite material to try and reduce the cost of shipping while still maintaining the margin. So basically you have technology causing a concentration of activity. On the other hand, policy can help, but also the private sector by reducing costs may also help sort of balance that in. So then I'll address the question from the audience first and then come to your question a bit later in two to three minutes. So I'll be very, very short. <laughs> Political factors, tension with Korea influencing monetary policy and stuff. Let me give state a basic principle. That's what I was trying to highlight. The vulnerability of the system when it's not just hostage to one uh, country's issuance power of global currency. Right? That's a, quite a kind of concern. So I think Indian Park also alluded to that. Increasingly, if any country, more so the United States, if they take policy decisions on their domestic consideration, be it political or economic, like raising interest rates, for instance, for their domestic considerations, it will have global implications. We have seen that uh, in the paper tantrum, they call it, in 2013, when barely the U.S. announced a possible change and it created havoc across the globe. So similar uncertainty, basically, whether it's coming from political factors or other factors, the principle remains is if a domestic country takes policy decisions based on purely domestic considerations, it may have implications for the global economy, especially for U.S., because U.S. is the dollar uh, issuance currency. That actually leads to the other question also, so I'll come to that. Cryptocurrencies, again, in the interest of time, be very brief here. The principle being is right now in the private sector. If you study a little bit the history of central banks, there are a lot of functions that are now performed by central banks, which for two, three hundred years were performed by the private sector. Settlement of payment system, for instance. This central bank as a government institution is a tentatively the long arc of history new concept, not more than hundred years. And other function was to finance government's wars, <coughs> uh, essentially fiscal support. So the independent central bank doing currency stability and monetary policy for domestic economic consideration is a relatively new phenomenon. Cryptocurrency falls in that category. Sooner or later, my sense is government or central bank will end up issuing their own cryptocurrency version or will have to partake it directly into that for it to become credible. Otherwise, it may become a bubble. 
The third one is uh, FX exposure in dollar and dollar as a reserve. What if China starts funding? Well, that's, that's the problem. That's what I was trying to allude. It's a vicious cycle. Um, it's, 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 it's in China's interest to keep buying because if they stop, they're, they're holding so much of U.S. reserves in financial, U.S. financial assets. If they stop buying and their demand for U.S. financial assets goes down, there will be a huge valuation impact, a benefit impact on China. So right now, it's like they have to continue a little bit, otherwise they have to take a balance sheet hit. Uh, precisely, again, in the interest of time, I won't go into detail, but this is the whole issue. It's like N minus one problem. Um, you cannot have one currency issuing the global reserve asset. The solution is not either issuing multiple, having a multiple currency system. There are all sorts of proposals out there, including issuance of new global currency supported by new, new global phenomena led by uh, UN Commission actually by uh, Joseph Stiglitz in 2009. I can talk more if somebody's interested after a coffee break. Um, lender of last resort, Amro, I'll leave that for the Amro colleagues here. Uh, on your question on trade, uh, one quick remark on that. The trade uptick may be steady uh, immediately, I think, and maybe stable also in the medium term, but it's unlikely to go back to relatively recent historical very high trends. Um, the reason is interesting to actually assess. There has been a considerable backlash against globalization, I think, and we have to acknowledge that very upfront. Um, um, Dean Kwa also highlighted uh, in, in, in his remarks the issue of inequalities. As economists, I think we are still working under the assumption, let's grow first and deal with the social implications like inequalities or environment degradation later. The overall mindset frame of thinking still remains the same. The focus tends to be still on economic growth first and the other things will have to come later. I think those things need to be acknowledged uh, up front. The reason I'm saying the comment on globalization is, for instance, in ASCAP, we did a, uh, we keep track of trade liberalizing uh, measures. So for on average, for each liberalizing trade measure that Asia Pacific countries have implemented between 2014 and 2017, 3.7 restrictive measures have been introduced. So there's a huge protectionist tendencies that are still there, which can actually, which cast a shadow on the medium to long term trade uh, outlook uh, go, uh, going forward. Then there are issues of China, countries like China as moving more and more towards high tech innovation led growth framework. So who's gonna take up the mantle of traditional manufacturing? Is it, gonna, is it going to go to Bangladesh or the small economies like that? Are they ready for that? Or given that increasingly more and more economies, especially advanced economies, are using robots, for instance, they don't need low cost labor from Bangladesh. So there's a possible issue of reshoring some of the jobs going back to advanced economies which were uh, being taken up by uh, cheap labor led um, support from Bangladesh and many other Asia Pacific developing countries. So it has implications actually on what we call a future of work. Um, there's going to be a skill bias going to be there. It's gonna create inequalities and those, uh, and those kind of issues. So I'm very skeptical about the medium to long term outlook uh, in terms of trade. It has linkages with how the production processes take place and how we, we're dealing with the globalization and inequality uh, nexus. Thank you. Ah, well, uh, being conscious of the time, I'll be very brief. Um, I think that many questions actually relate to the issues of uh, uh, how we reform the uh, international monetary systems. And then I think uh, many, you know, in a way, just uh, al already, I, I myself alluded to the uh, Trickenstein Nana. In fact, uh, you know, the US uh, uh, having that uh, sort of international reserve currency, being, a being able to uh, has, has a little bit of difficulty sort of uh, balancing between their domestic interests and then uh, uh, what they actually have to do uh, in the interest of the global community. Uh, and uh, that they have, uh, in a way, like a types of uh, signaling all to themselves. Uh, so there is this uh, challenge. But um, the big issue in terms of discussing this reform, I mean, it's been going on since the global financial crisis, is lack of alternatives. <laughs> in this current context, so it's going to be a long-term challenge. Yeah, uh, you know, let, let's uh, let's be, in a way, frank <laughs> and truthful to the uh, to the uh, the you know the actual reality. Um, so it's going to be a uh, very much a long-term challenge. Given that, what else can we do in a way as a media? 
second best options. And that's where we, uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the region especially, uh, stress this the role of uh, uh, the lender of less reserve financial safety nets uh, to add additional buffer, having uh, you know, enough uh, foreign exchange uh, the reserves and uh, learning the lessons from the, you know, the global financial crisis, the European debt crisis, we have to really focus on the macro level prudential regulation and uh, supervision. Uh, and what's also important is we have to understand that the, you know, the global uh, financial systems are it's incredibly interconnected. And what we also see is the rise of uh, systemically important financial systems financial institutions, it's called city. And uh, we really have to think about the consequences of, uh, you know, that city having trouble and then uh, spillovers uh, across uh, the region and then across the, around the world. So being careful of how to really deal with the city and then uh, how to uh, monitor the buildup of uh, systemic risk in the re at the regional level going beyond the uh, domestic uh, boundaries. On the global, Trade, uh, the trade recovery. I do feel that uh, you know there are actually uh, a lot uh, coming from uh, the cyclical uh, factors. That uh, given that you know the U.S. and European demand for uh, Asian exports have increased uh, quite su uh, substantially, uh, there has been uh, I'm sure the pent up demand uh, coming from a long extended period of uh, weaknesses in the past few years. Uh, but going forward, I do agree uh, with uh, Kishen uh, that. You know, there are uh, much uh, more, uh, you know, positive momentum we can expect and we should actually try to make that momentum go forward in terms of reducing the transaction cost and then trade cost and then reduce the, uh, uh, you know, the cost of uh, trans the trans uh, 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 transporter, uh, the, uh, uh, the transportation and then connectivity shipping. I, I do uh, also like to know the one thing about the, uh, uh, the you know, digital trade and internet, uh, also e-commerce. Asia is already leading the e-commerce uh, around the world. Uh, we have a, a lot more uh, to hope for, uh, being able to uh, you know, make uh, max maximum potential of this uh, e-trade uh, through uh, better technology and then uh, reducing the, uh, uh, the uh, digital divide uh, within the country and then uh, around the uh, region as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm just going to pick up one or two of the questions. On cryptocurrency, I think at the moment it's still quite small, so I don't think it's going to be a big issue until it gets big. And, and, and I doubt if it will ever replace uh, central bank uh, fiat money, because uh, cryptocurrency by nature is sort of limited in terms of the, uh, uh, the volume that can be uh, produced. Uh, although, of course, there are new cryptocurrencies coming out all the time, uh, and I think central banks uh, are studying this uh, impact on monetary policy very closely. By the moment, it, I think it's still early days, so it's become more of a speculative asset than uh, a, a use for means of payment for a certain transaction, but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's just, I, I don't think it, it's an issue for central banks yet. Uh, uh, on the issue of uh, US dollar funding, I, I really don't think that's a, a big issue. Uh, it's an N minus one problem. It uh, has to be managed uh, because if, if you don't uh, fund in US dollar, you fund in yen, there's also the risk of yen uh, you know, currency as well. So you can't get away from it. And I think it's a commercial decision for the private sector, whether they fund US dollar or, or local currency. And already a lot of progress has been made uh, in terms of funding in local currency. If you look around the region, for instance, in Thailand, uh, most of the corporates prefer to issue bonds rather than buy borrow from the local banks. And broker banks are having a hard time trying to find <laughs> borrowers for, for the money. <laughs> and the same thing in Malaysia. Uh, so it varies probably from country to country. Uh, I think the, the local currency uh, in the market has really grown a lot in the region, uh, not to be underestimated. Uh, and as I said earlier, you know, regulators are really, are really keeping a very close eyes on who is borrowing in foreign currency to make sure there's no mismatch. Uh, uh, then the other question about trade, uh, I think you know, the other speakers have addressed this. 
my own sense is that you know it's the trade you know, went into a, a, a tailspin, a, a downfall because of two things. One, the collapse in, in the growth of US and Europe, so external demand came down. And then the shift in China from investment led to consumption led growth, which did, led the collapse in commodity, uh, demand for commodities. But those have sort of bottomed out and now we are seeing the upswing. You know? So a large part of the improvement is really the upswing and and it's likely to continue for some time. I don't think it's going to uh, stop anytime soon. But it probably will not recover back to its old uh, pre-crisis sort of a uh, strength. Uh, so it could be, you know, that global trade going forward is not going to be as big a driver of growth as before. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the region has become more integrated and intra-regional trade has become you know, quite significant. Uh, as you pointed out in your own study. And I think that provides us a, a buffer uh, for, for, for the region, which is a uh, uh, risk. And the region itself has become the largest uh, consumer of uh, market for consumer goods. I mean, we are the <laughs> most rapidly growing middle class uh, in the world, right? So I think Asia has, you know, has, has reached a stage of development where it's probably able to sustain growth uh, on its own. Uh, Without, uh, even if, if, if trade were to, you know, uh, be much weaker than before. And the nature of trade has also shifted from goods to services. Increasingly, you know, we are consuming services and here technology is, you know, is, 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 is having a major impact on, on how we con trade and how we consume. Um, so, I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I really tempted to ask everyone to stay another hour, but uh, unfortunately our uh, uh, time is binding and we are supposed to stop here. Uh, but we really uh, started talking about um, uh, you know, different dimensions of uh, globalization and regional integration. And I hope, really hope uh, we can have another occasion soon to follow up our discussion. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank all the uh, panelists for stimulating discussion and please join me again to thank the uh, panelists.